Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation. As if the ongoing border standoff with China on the line of actual control was not enough, New Delhi has suddenly found itself in the midst of another unprecedented land dispute with its friendly neighbor, Nepal. In a significant and worrying development, earlier this month, Nepal's House of Representatives passed a constitutional amendment to include Kalapani, Lipu Lake and Limbiadura in Nepal's official map. The proximate reason for this anger seems to be India's decision to inaugurate a new 80-kilometer road connecting to the border with China at the Lipu Lake Pass. India has clarified that the road is completely, completely on its territory, but Nepal refuted this, claiming that at least 17 kilometers of this new road passes through Nepalese territory. The dispute then took a turn for the worse, escalating into a full-blown diplomatic crisis after the Indian Army chief suggested that Nepal's cartographic changes were done at the behest of another country, meaning China. The Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi later clarified that the new map released by Prime Minister Oli and endorsed by Nepal's lower house of the parliament are completely unacceptable. So by hastily including territories held by India in its new political map, isn't Kathmandu asking New Delhi to swallow an unacceptable fate accompli? What is the domestic political angle in Nepal behind this new development? And more importantly, what role does the elephant in the room, China, play in India-Nepal relations? To discuss these developments, I have with me two people who understand Indo-Nepal relations very closely. Rakesh Sood was India's ambassador to Nepal. Kanakmani Dikshit is the founder of the magazine Himal South Asian and is a senior journalist based in Kathmandu. So, welcome to the National Security Conversation, Ambassador Sood and uh, Mr. Dikshit. Let me begin this conversation with you, Mr. Dikshit. Um, earlier this month, Nepal's House of Representatives unanimously approved a constitution amendment bill to change the country's political map to include areas like um, Kalapani, Lipu Lake, and Limbiatura in Nepal's official map. The new map includes areas which India claims to be completely within or lie within the uh, territory of India. Please explain the context to our viewers of this rather a dramatic um, sort of cartographic move by Nepal at this point of time? Well, uh, the, the source of this uh, problem, if you will, or this issue goes back to misdemeanors by the British colonials. Uh, in fact, going back to the time of the East India Company. So when uh, many uh, Indian observers are actually having to brush up on this uh, matter of Lipu Lake, Olympia Dura, and Kalapani. It's quite understandable because this is not something that was on anybody's radar. Whereas it was certainly under the radar, on the radar of the Nepali polity and the intelligentsia. But to go right back to where it all happened, it goes to the expansionary wars waged by the Nepali, the Kathmandu Darbar moving towards the Sutlej in the early 1800s. And the British, uh, the East India Company decided to call a halt to this by waging a war. And so the Anglo-Nepal War of 1814-1815, uh, which ended in Nepal having to cede properties to the uh, territories to the East and West, uh, Sutlej uh, uh, on the West, as far as the Sutlej was the ambitions of the Nepali rulers, perhaps even further towards Kashmir, uh, but they were made to give up Kumau and Garhwal. And in doing that, the language of the Treaty of Sugauli, which was actually drafted in 1815, says uh, the Raja of Nepal uh, cedes for all time, as also on behalf of his descendants, all territories west of the Kali River. So the, essentially, uh, the Kali River becomes the boundary between the western boundary of Nepal and uh, the question till today and the reason for the controversy today has to do with which is the Kali River, which means which is the origin of the Kali River, which is the branch of the Kali River. 
and uh, that is where uh, in Nepal, uh, just as India started becoming, modern India started becoming cartographically alert after its independence, Nepal began to look, and the intelligentsia and the polity in Kathmandu began to look into the maps in uh, after the Panchayat era. And um, so since then, there's been a rumbling within Nepali society that the lands east of the Kali should be Nepal, but the upper branch of the, uh, the upper stem of the Kali River, also known as the Mahakali River, uh, in the original British maps showed them to be where Nepal today believes they are, that there is a river that leads towards the high ridge of Limpia Dura. Uh, however, if, in, during British times, around 1857 or so, suddenly, uh, while the original map did show the stem as being Kali or the Kuti Yangdi going up to Limpia Dura, it suddenly shifts uh, eastward towards uh, the pass known as Lipu Lake, possibly because the British realized that they could cock a snook on Nepal and uh, when Kathmandu was not looking in this remote territory, deciding that the actual valuable strategic pass or for uh, pilgrimage purposes or for trade was actually the Lipu Lake Pass because that led, uh, that led into uh, Kailas Manasarovar on the other side. So, uh, the maps begin to start showing the origins of the Kali differently. So from that, we should come to the post-1990 era in Nepal. In between, Nepal uh, accepted the map as it evolved, uh, as essentially with a country without a cartographic department even. What was given by the British, I presume, was kept by the Nepalese as their own. but as people began to investigate, there were two areas that came into question. One is the entire triangle towards Limpia Dura, another area called Kalapani, uh, which even under the later British maps were said to be on the east of the uh, Kali and hence they would then naturally be in Nepal. The complication comes when uh, probably related to the 1962 debacle with China, uh, India's extreme sensitivity towards the northern frontiers. The Nepali rulers seem to have decided to let many of the, uh, there were uh, Indian listening posts in Nepal. It is said up to 18 or 19, uh, but 17 of them were removed in 1969. But one was allowed to remain, perhaps be because of excessive sensitivities. We do not know the details at this point. Uh, so much has to be learned actually from going into the archives. But in, in any case, um, in the Panchayat era, which means the king ruled era, the king seemed to have decided there is a problem out there, there is a dispute. Uh, we, we do uh, consider that there has been some uh, Nepal territory within present day India, modern India. However, we will not raise that issue for now. There are some instances when Nepali. Uh, and, um, diplomats and administrators have uh, recalled going to the king, and this is recorded, and they have said, well, we got enough issues within there right now, let it be. However, in the democratic area, era, that was not to be. Issues kept, came in, kept coming up, and essentially, just to bring you up to, up to par then, since uh, the time of Atal Bihari Vajpayee uh, talking to uh, uh, Girija Prasad Koirala, uh, uh, from uh, the time of I.K. Gujral onward to uh, Sushil Koirala and uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, to Sushma Swaraj uh, talking to the Foreign Minister of Nepal, Mr. Mahendra Pandey, till the present, there has been acknowledgement that there is a border dispute. Many of them have been resolved, but there are two that are remaining. One of them is this Kalapani area, which includes the Limpia Dura area. Uh, be before I go to Ambassador Sood um, on his take on the matter, one quick question, follow-up question uh, for you, Mr. Dixit. I mean, let alone the substance of it, um, do you agree with the unilateral manner in which uh, uh, Kathmandu has gone about uh, uh, changing the map, as it were, in, in many ways by adding these territories um, held by India, 
Um, isn't Kathmandu asking New Delhi to accept uh, an unacceptable and rather humiliating uh, fait accompli as a clear? Escalatory action, the escalatory move actually was made by India, as I understand mm -hmm. it. And it was mm -hmm. uh, a response or a tit for tat, if you will. So what happened was that uh, while ne the fact that Nepal claimed uh, Kalapani and the Limpia Dura Triangle was well known to Indian bureaucracy, if not the Indian polity, um, the issue actually actually came up for discussion when in uh, May 2015 in Siam, an agreement was made between Mr. Modi and, uh, and President Xi to hmm. open up uh, the Lipu Lake area for pilgrimage right. and trade. At that time itself, Nepal had wrote, written a letter of, uh, a note verbal, I believe is the right word, to the, separately to the two, two governments, Chinese and Indians. Uh, and yet, so that means that the issue was already known. Yet, in uh, November last, 2019, the Defense Minister of uh, India goes ahead and with much fanfare, uh, inaugurates what he calls the link road to Lipu Lake. And so right. if you ask me, that is the unilateral action or that is the trigger that then right. made it uh, untenable for the Nepali polity to sit back, given that things have been taken a step ahead. Ambassador Sood, what, what is your sense of uh, uh, what's happening? In the Indian reactions have been pretty muted. I looked at the statement issued by the MEA. Uh, the statement has been pretty muted. But in any case, going back to what uh, Kanak Saab said, there's a lot on the uh, table here. He sort of uh, right. goes back uh, into great detail to the colonial times and sort of uh, makes that claim about these particular uh, three areas. What's your response? Well, I think um, I, I agree with Kanak when he says that uh, this is something that happened during the British times, because actually, if we go back into history, the Treaty of Sigoli of 1816 just makes a very bland statement that the Kali River constitutes the boundary between India and Nepal, or British India and Nepal. Mind you, these were the days of the East India Company, 1816, right? And uh, at that stage, there are no maps or coordinates or latitude, longitude or anything like that that is attached to it. The maps are then subsequently brought out. Uh, and those maps show a certain alignment of the Kali River, which go exactly as Mr. Kanak said, towards the tributary, which is going towards the northwest, towards Limpiadura. Now, uh, what we need to remember is that the Kali River goes up north along the India-Nepal boundary and slightly north of a village called Garbeang, uh, there are three, four, three or four tributaries that actually come and join into what constitutes Kali River. So the dispute essentially arises as to which of these tributaries should we count as the actual Kali. But there is actually an exchange of letters from the then um, British officer who was there in terms of which of the villages would go to Nepal and would, would, which of the villages would come to Kumau region in India. And it starts getting reversed. By 1850, the maps have been redone. We are the tributary that is now uh, coming from the northeast has uh, is the one that is being shown as the Kali River. And uh, this is the one that first it says the Lipu Lake Pass. And then subsequently, there is yet another map in 1879, which says that it is actually not even the Lipu Lake Pass, but it is the Kalapani Springs. This, there is a spring at Kalapani. And it is the spring at Kalapani, which is the origin. And so therefore, if that is the origin, then the boundary goes up to Kalapani and then drops down along the watershed of uh, another tributary called Pankha Gad, And mm. that then constitutes the boundary. Now, actually, it is interesting. I, 
um, you know, the, as Mr. Dixit also said, this issue did not come up at all because the maps were accepted as they were. I don't think uh, Nepal had any uh, arguments with the British. By this time, it was the British Indian Empire. I don't think they had any arguments uh, with the British as when these maps were being modified. These were the maps that we inherited. And these right? maps are available in the public domain, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. These maps are available in the public domain. In fact, uh, even the Nepali maps that were... You see, then British, British India and Nepal signed yet another comprehensive treaty in 1923, which was like the equivalent of a treaty of peace and friendship. It sort of consolidated uh, various arrangements between uh, British India and Nepal. And the 1924 maps that Nepal issued also show this particular alignment that is of the 1879 alignment. Hmm. And... Uh, well, You're talking about the 1961 um, Nepal. I'm China. talking of the 1879 alignment. Right, 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 right. And that is what has there in the 1924 maps of Nepal. India became independent in 1947, and we inherit these boundaries. So this is what has continued. Now, as and I agree with Mr. Dixit when he says that uh, the issue was never raised. Now whether it was not raised by the king, King Mahindra or uh, uh, King Tribhuvan out of sensitivity to India. I mean, I would have a slightly different view because King Mahindra was uh, quite adept at using the China card. Um, and so I, didn't, I don't see him displaying that kind of sensitivity. But nonetheless, it was never raised till the 1990s. So the first time it was raised was 1997. My guess is, my guess is that in 1996, we had signed the, the Mahakali Treaty, although it is not directly relevant, but I, mm. my guess is that we had signed the Mahakali Treaty, which is a, you know, uh, uh, which is a large uh, hydro project on the Mahakali River, because what is known as the Kali, as it comes downstream, gets more water, gets more rivers joining in, is also called the Mahakali or it is also called the Sharda. Now, right. so, but that, so perhaps there was a renewed interest and uh, therefore in 1997, the issue was raised. And, uh, but the issue that has been, that was raised from 1997 and subsequently where it was agreed that the foreign secretaries will sit down and talk about it. That issue was never actually about Limpia Dura. That issue was related to basically Kalapani. Mm -hmm. Because it was the issue, you know, at Kalapani, which is on route to Lipu Lake, which is a small area on route to Lipu Lake, is where there is an army camp or an ITBP, Indo-Tibet Border Police camp. And the issue was largely that this Kalapani falls within Nepali territory. That depends on whether you take the 1850-1856 alignment or the 1879 alignment. If you take the 1879 alignment, then even Kalapani does not fall in Nepal. If you take the 1850-1856 alignment, then yes, Kalapani would fall in Nepal. So that is the kind of thing. So Limpia Dhura was never is not an issue that has ever been uh, talked of between India and Nepal. Back to you, Mr. Dixit. There is a lot that uh, Baza Sudha said in response to what you said initially. Um, you know, essentially making the argument that uh, uh, the the uh, borders and the maps have been given down to the um, Indian state that came into being in 1947 by the British. Uh, so it is not as if the Indian side has reinvented anything thereafter. So what's your response to that? Yes. It is uh, because uh, the Indian state has inherited the map that we need to go to the shenanigans during the British era. And unfortunately, the Indian state will also inherit the shenanigans of the British era. So the revised revision of the map progressively by the British to show the, the, the main stem of the Kali River, which should be 
something that today could be decided when we actually sit down for talks. This revision unilaterally by the British uh, does not overcome what the Sugauli Treaty is. The Sugauli Treaty was the only uh, treaty that defines, it's a border treaty, uh, in the sense that nothing else that has come thereafter has superseded what the Sugauli Treaty said. And so what we need to do simply today uh, between two countries that were friendly, remain relatively friendly and need to remain friendly in the future is that let us go back to the wordings of the Sugauli Treaty and decide what is the Kali River to its source. That defines the border. This is how I, how I see it. Uh, just otherwise, there are claims and counterclaims, paper from this side and paper from that side. For example, I could tell you, uh, and this is something for the negotiators to be doing, I hope soon, but uh, number one, uh, it is not only 1997, as uh, uh, Ambassador spoke about, but starting in the 70s, Issues, this issue has come up between Nepal and India, and in the uh, joint technical, what's it called, the joint technical level Nepal India boundary committee, which started work in 1981. That also started doing what is known as strip mapping. And mm. some people say, uh, I do, would not say to what accuracy, but 92%, no, 98% of the issues between Nepal and India have been resolved. So, in a way, there was a great progress, but then they always got stuck when it came to two issues, Kalapani and the reaches to the north, and the Susta River by the Gandaki River in the south. So these uh, issues have been discussed between Nepal and India. It is just that it is not general knowledge uh, out in the Indian uh, polity or intelligentsia. But then after the Joint Technical Committee, then you have in uh, 2014 something known as the Border the border working group begins to meet. It was decided in 2007, but begins to meet only in 2014. So there has been actually over since the 70s, a continuous concern from the Nepali side regarding the Western boundary that abuts uh, adjacent to Kumao. So uh, right. I would say, and this all, all of this, by the way, ends in the string of meetings and concerns uh, comes right down to August 2019, when even the border working group is not able to resolve the issue of Kalapani, and hence the two foreign secretaries decide in uh, uh, 2000, August 2019, this is when uh, the present, uh, actually not the foreign secretary, the present uh, foreign minister, Mr. Jai Shankar, comes to Kathmandu, and they decide to uh, elevate the discussion to the foreign secretary level, and this has right. not met here. So, what I would suggest right. to you is that over the last few years, there has been prevarication and delays uh, from the Indian side rather than the Nepal side. And if right. they could only sit down and talk, perhaps uh, one could be talking about the issues that we have raised today in front of you. Ambassador Sood, I think uh, in 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 some ways, what Mr. Dixit is saying is saying is that. There is an evolving um, cartographic consciousness in Nepal today. Um, and, and what may be happening um, uh, today is perhaps a result of that evolving sort of cartographic consciousness. Um, on the other hand, um, you seem to be arguing, or, or the Indian side seems to be arguing, that the um, Indian side uh, would like to sort of uh, hold on to the sort of colonial border settlement that happened between the British India and uh, Nepal. Um, how, how do you sort of respond to these two uh, divergent worldviews, as it were, if, if they were at all divergent? Well, I, I think we need to, first of all, we need to understand that there is a multiplicity of facts, right? Right. right. One fact is the Treaty of Sigoli, and the Treaty of Sigoli only identifies the Kali River. It does not indicate which of the tributaries of Kali River constitutes the actual, should actually be given the name of Kali. Right. Because there are different alignments in different British maps, at least three. And here I'm actually, uh, you know, there was this discussion came up in the Nepal parliament in 1998. And there is a letter from the Nepal Prime Minister to the Delegated Legislation and Government Assurances Committee of the National Assembly of Nepal. It is dated 18th June 1998. 
and uh, it's i i mean it actually quotes exactly and i can uh, i it says according to the treaty of sagoli signed in 1816 with british india the kali river was established as the western boundary of nepal according to a map prepared by the survey of india in 1850 the kali river which has its source at the lipu lake pass was shown as the boundary mm. in another map published by the survey of india in 1856 the same river was shown as the boundary according to the above mentioned maps kalapani comes under the territory of nepal it goes on to say subsequently the survey of india published a map in 1879 in which the boundary was shifted from the kali river to the ridge on the southern side of pankha gad river beyond kalapani in this map kalapani has been shown on the indian side so uh i mean this is as per an official communication by the prime minister of nepal to the national assembly of nepal in 1998 so clearly there is a multiplicity of alignments that exists now um i mean we can assume why the british did this but um i don't think that there is we can decide it this kind of a thing in any a, through a legal process obviously there has to be a political process and that is why even here let me make it quite clear that uh, the chinese have never had any doubts in their mind as to whether lipu lake falls within india or it should be part of nepal because as you uh, happy mon as you said uh, when we signed our uh, first treaty with china in the, in the 1950s um, lipu lake was identified both as the route for pilgrimage as well as for border trade in fact subsequently after 1962 both the pilgrimage and the border trade stopped the pilgrimage began in 1981 and once again it was through lipu lake and uh, it was a bilateral understanding between india and china uh, the border trade was resumed in 1991 through mm. lipu lake once mm. again mm. and uh, it was a uh, never an issue that so point i'm making is that right from this time uh, nepal had accepted that lipu lake was a uh, part of indian territory the issue remained as i said of the small region of kalapani according to me if uh, you know when you have a small cancer you don't treat it by making it a bigger cancer and i think what nepal has done is essentially by first of all it has enlarged what was a difference in territorial perception has been converted into a territorial dispute the size of it has been enlarged and also we have now taken certain steps uh and this is what i find sort of contradictory now um and while i fully accept mr dikshit's point that india has certainly been extremely tardy and we should have responded to the nepali suggestion for talks uh which we unfortunately didn't but i do think that nepal has now started adopting a somewhat contradictory approach because on one hand it calls for dialogue and on the other it is taking actions to prevent the dialogue by querying the pitch is there is there a specific strategic uh, importance to the lipu lake pass given the fact that uh, the new road that rajnath singh uh, he inaugurated the other day is perhaps the quickest links between new delhi and tibet as it were so um, is there is there a strategic importance to uh, this lipu lake pass and the road that has been built um, and and given the state of india china relations at this point of time um, and and what is happening on the land of active control um, is is there is there a possibility that one could sort of add the strategic importance of this particular lipu lake pass the location of it to that mix and say there is perhaps some element of i'm just playing the devil's advocate here some element of truth in what the army chief is saying um that it is being done at the behest of somebody else because of its strategic importance to the location well i 
don't think so. I think the army chief and I here I tend to agree with uh, Mr. Kanak Dixit that I think the army chief uh, made a statement that was uncalled for. It reflected a degree of insensitivity, mm -hmm. and uh, and I and for the simple reason that Nepal, the two facts here, first that Nepal had first asked for meetings on the issue of Kalapani, on the issue of boundary in this area with us in more recent times in November of last year. Right. Now in November of last year, there was, we didn't really have the COVID uh, right. pandemic, right. nor did we have the boundary issue with China flaring up in this manner in which it has uh, during the right. last month or so. So therefore, right. think that Nepal would have sent us this note verbal suggesting dates. We, um, my guess is somehow or the other, um, and this is uh, having been a former bureaucrat myself, I sort of have a feel for how these things happen and how things slip between the cracks. You know, our ambassador was retiring at the end of December. Hmm. And he was on his farewell calls and things like that. So it kind of got dropped and it was thought. Now, the new ambassador only got there after two, two and a half months. Uh, the foreign secretary was retiring end of January. So once again, the foreign secretary level talk. So the various dates that were proposed by the Nepalese side um, just got ignored. Uh, they got shelved. By the time the new foreign secretary took over, by the time the new ambassador got into position, by this time, COVID had, by March, uh, COVID had uh, erupted and all the rest of it. I'm not using this, I'm not uh, presenting this as a justification right. for, uh, right. Right. you know, the fact that we were insensitive because after all, if we have a neighborhood first policy, I mean, surely uh, it should be possible to pick up the phone and, you know, Nepal is hardly uh, an hour and a half flight away. So you could go in the morning, come back in the evening and that kind of thing. All I'm saying is that uh, while, so when actually the issue was taken up, uh, there was neither the China factor nor the COVID factor. So that's one fact. So that's mm. one reason why I think that mm. it is unfair to, on the part of the army chief to have suggested. Second, I said two facts. The second fact is that the army chief of India is the honorary general of the Nepal army. Right. And similarly, the army chief of Nepal is an honorary general of the Indian army. It's a tradition that reflects the close ties between the two armies, the two institutions in India and Nepal. And so even taking that into consideration, it is uh, inappropriate for an honorary general of the Nepal army to actually <laughs> make this kind of a comment. I mean, it reflects a degree of insensitivity. And that is why, if you've noticed, uh, General Naravne in his recent comments, you know, he spoke at the IMA passing out parade the other day, uh, just two days ago. And in uh -huh. his more recent comments, he has actually uh, tried to repair this kind of, uh, you know, the damage that was done by his earlier statement, making that kind of uh, suggestion. Right. Might I make right, a right. So, yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Dixon. Just, just two, two or three points because I think we might not get back to them. One of them is when um, Ambassador Stu talks about how this issue has to be resolved uh, essentially now at a political level. I believe so, but I would also add the fact that um, there is some work remaining here for photographers and geomorphologists and people who study river morphology because. Uh, the the one document, incredibly, that stands alone is from 1815. It's not even 1816 because 1816 was when the actual papers were, uh, the treaty between the Kashmandu Darbar and the East India Company were exchanged because there were some altercations and some logistics in between. But the, this, the essential treaty was uh, prepared in 18, 1815. So here we're having to look back at something from 1815 because there had been no other document to replace it, number one. In which case, we have to look at 
what is the source of the river kali and in which case do we rely we go by what the british did over time unilaterally by themselves which then has been inherited by the republic of india or do we also at this point however late it may be go back to the original intent of the one document that has not been superseded because these are international relations and if it is two centuries ago it is two centuries ago the other the point is it seems to me somewhere that the indian argument may be that this is possession and possession will uh, over a course of time with the nepalis having acceded sometimes even even having made some comments e even though the sugoli treaty has not been superseded statements made documents made available in between even by the nepali side does that work it seems to me that the argument seems to be that i read in the press out of india uh is that essentially we have had it all along and therefore uh, since the british uh, moved on i would say that there are enough examples i will not name the regions within india's own uh, territories which it considers its own but for decades it is not been able to get possession but still it stays in india's map so i think we need to indeed with all these various understanding move towards the political solution that ambassador sood um, refers to which i think is essential uh, and other point that is a little confusing uh, for me here sitting in kathmandu is uh, uh, because i do consider the trigger and the, for the escalation and this uh, sudden eruption between the two countries has to do with two or three events actually happened in india you might say nepal overreacted but it is a reaction the action actually firmly happened after uh, the cian meeting when nepal had already the kathmandu foreign office had already made its point very clear yet to go ahead with an inauguration of this very disputed territory with full fanfare and band baja a digital kind of uh, inauguration and then the army chief uh, whatever he said all of that cleared the pitch so the question for me in kathmandu is why do that why did india looking at its super sensitive northern borders especially at a time when sikkim the sikkim border was already a little uh, uh, mm -hmm. it was it was getting it was right. not interesting i guess but it, something was happening there for sure but the ladakh thing was already moving on and then right. to create a different front why would they do it i would like to believe that uh, perhaps it is just the indian government the indian state right hand not knowing what the left hand was doing could it be that could it be that south <laughs> did not know i i think minister i you tell me think, uh, i think um, i would tend to agree i think i don't <laughs> think that there was a malafide because uh, right you know the road was the construction of this road began uh when i was posted as ambassador in nepal more than 10 years ago the road it's just an 80 km road but it goes through uh uh you know a difficult kind of a terrain and so it has actually taken us about 10 11 years to complete the road at no point during the road construction being undertaken by india were there any protests from nepal or anything like that for the simple reason that you know uh, on the ground happy mon um, right. there is very poor infrastructure and we have an open border with nepal and so it doesn't matter if the road is on this side the nepalese would also use it for border trade they would also use it to send their pilgrims to kalash mansar over it you know and nobody would care i mean as long as there is infrastructure it is going to be used by people on both sides of the border so the fact that this was being built there had been no protests about it and so on my guess is that uh, when the defense minister uh, now i really should not be saying this but uh, but i think when the defense minister actually inaugurated it i think he was doing it because the pilgrimage season as you know it normally begins at around this time so he kind of it was more a, a, a political kind of a thing and right. uh, i don't think that it was thought of as something 
that would arouse sensitivities on the other side, uh, perhaps, perhaps wrongly as we see it. But here again, I think uh, part of the issue is to do with domestic politics. You know, so I think in, in some ways what um, 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 Ambassador Sood says also conveys the fact that there isn't enough communication or conversation happening between the two sides. Now, is there, is there a feeling within the Nepalese government and the strategic community that the Indian side does not take uh, its relationship with Nepal that seriously, serious enough that it engages in a conversation on sensitive issues, even though there is a lockdown and pandemic and all of that is on, shouldn't the diplomatic conversation and political conversation, conversation continue between the two sides? Is there a feeling of that kind in that Nepal, uh, Mr. Dixon? Well, I think there is, and certainly uh, if, if uh, there is that feeling and uh, uh, this present spat is sure to uh, lead to a different level of engagement, I presume, but I didn't get to say fully what I intended to earlier when I said the Indian state left hand may not know what the right hand is doing. If the sensitivities of Nepal after May 2015 and the CN meeting and the agreement on Deepu Lake between China and India had been properly considered by the, those who manage Indian foreign affairs, and if that also, if they had their hand on the Nepali pulse and the growing Nepal understanding in Kathmandu about Limpu Adhura, Lipu Lake, then perhaps there would have been an attempt to say, should we do this inauguration with this fanfare or should we not? Uh, that is one. The other is, with, what I have heard is there were some discussions ongoing, perhaps about, uh, and this is now I'm going into an area of conjecture, but that perhaps Nepal India could come to a conclusion about the garrison, the military garrison of the ITBP that stays in Kalapani, could it be moved out? My, just a mild conspiracy proposal, theory, is this, <laughs> that could it be that the defense minister, the army chief, both are speaking about this, could it be that the South Bloc actually was unaware, in, and had it been aware, would they have said this is, whoever may be right or wrong, let us not go through with this, because in the end, as you see, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the escalation happened actually after uh, Rajnath Singh's speech. So somebody was not looking at Nepal with care at that point. Well, well, that, that is true. I, mean, I think you're right about the immediate escalation part of it, but I think there has been this uneasy, uneasiness within, within Nepal about India. Going back to say 2015, uh, be it about the alleged interference of the Indian state in the constitution making of, the, um, of, of, of Nepal, or the, um, the, the alleged uh, uh, blockade, the economic blockade in 2015. So um, have things been brewing thereafter? Um, so is there, is, no, have, we fact, reached the, have we reached a, a stage where it is, it is not possible to go back to good old days? Oh, I think it is essential to go back to good old days, as you term it. Uh, and uh, some of them were not very good, but old days certainly. Uh, the way I like to say is uh, when people say, is India the big brother? I say, no, India is big and it is a brother. And that is the situation that we must take ourselves back to. Um, but uh, as far as the re immediate past relationship goes, the constitution writing, firstly, there was the conflict, uh, 10 years of conflict. Then there was the constitution writing. Then there was the earthquake. Then the, finally, the promulgation of the constitu constitution with a lot of heartburn within Nepal and inter-community uh, juxtapositions that came to the fore, etc. In all of that, a blockade happened right in, uh, right at the end of it, uh, almost like a thank you for the constitution, no thank you. And so the uh, what had happened when Prime Minister Narendra Modi had gone to Nepal in 2014, and he had got a rousing welcome and applause in the parliament. But from that, we had, want, we had expected the relationship to go from up to up. Instead, the blockade made it all come crashing down. Now, over the last three, four or five years, actually, things had been on the mend. And I believe our job now should be uh, somehow to uh, isolate this one problem from the rest of the body politic and the geopolitics of the two countries. Uh, because it doesn't make any sense for either side, either economy, either culture, either society to 
let this canker uh, invade right. the rest of the relationship. Right. Um, Ambassador Sood, you did mention briefly earlier on about the domestic polit politics in Nepal. Um, do you think there is a domestic political angle to the current development? And is it, is it, is it Mr. Poli uh, trying to regain some of his lost political capital in Nepal um, by sort of rousing the anti-India feelings? Is that, is that what you're getting at? Well, yes, and this is not a new phenomenon. We've seen that in the past. And uh, what happens is that, uh, you know, uh, Nepali politics has had, uh, I would say that, uh, has been in a state of transition virtually since 1990, when the first Janandolan mm -hmm. took place, the beginning of multi-party democracy. If you look at it from 1990, and then, of course, there was the 10 years insurgency, Maoist insurgency, then the peace process, then a new constitution, abolition of monarchy, declaration of republic, introduction of federal structure, and so on and so on. So from 1990 till now, uh, my guess is that Nepal has had about 25 or 26 prime ministers. Some of them have been prime ministers twice over or thrice over. So it has been a period of a uh, fair amount of political churn. And during this period, we've seen various kinds of coalitions being emerge. Sometimes a coalition of uh, the Congress with the Marxist, Leninist, the UML party, sometimes with the Maoist, sometimes the Maoist with the UML, sometimes with somebody else, sometimes the ex royalist parties or the more uh, the RPPs and so on also end up joining them. Now, in this process, very often, there is one foreign policy issue that becomes a scapegoat, a convenient scapegoat for uh, political, domestic political infighting between Nepali political parties, between the government and the opposition, let's say. And that is India's relationship. And, um, and that has been, this, this, is a, this is a phenomenon that has surfaced repeatedly in Nepal. And I think that it is true that there were uh, some, Prime Minister Oli was facing some difficulties. You know, at the end of April, he uh, took two controversial decisions. He introduced two ordinances, which had far reaching implications. Uh, right. There was a lot of objection to it from within his own party. Uh, there was a feeling that perhaps his party might uh, break up or things like that. And the fact that, and so, Quite hurriedly, he then withdrew those two ordinances as a means of patching up things. So therefore, uh, the comments that were made by the uh, army chief, the inauguration, etc., played into uh, played into the turbulent right. politics. Right. It led to an eruption of Nepali nationalism. Everybody came right. under the banner of Nepali nationalism, I mean, you know. Uh, right. And uh, the flip side of the coin of Nepali nationalism, as I said, is always anti-Indianism. And so we see uh, that emerge as the counterpart. And, uh, right. and it's, you know, because we also, let's not forget, I mean, Prime Minister Roli in Parliament, when he was talking about this, was talking about how the Indian virus is more lethal than the Nepali, uh, than the Italian or the Chinese virus. He was talking about um, that the national symbol of India, is it Satyamev Jayate or should it be Sihamev Jayate, you know, that India is trying to exercise. I, so, so when it comes down to rhetoric, then I'm afraid uh, there is uh, both sides, there is enough blame to go around. Let me put it like this. Yeah, I but, mean, I think... The but at the same time, I would be the first to say that uh, any a smaller country a country that is smaller in size is always very sensitive about sovereignty related issues. And India as the right. larger country has to have that sensitivity to be able to understand that and therefore to factor it in uh, in terms of its dealings with Nepal or any other neighboring country. Mr. Dixit, I, I want you to come in on the, um, the report prepared by the eminent persons group, um, the mandated by uh, the two prime ministers in 2015. Uh, the report was submitted in 2018. Um, we have no idea what has happened to that. What, what's your take on that? Is that, but, is that a way uh, forward? Happy one. I can't uh, 
not speak into Nepali politics and follow up on um, of course, please. Kya karna? Please, 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 please. Yes, sure, sure, of course. Essentially, um, the question is, uh, th there is no doubt that uh, Prime Minister Oli uh, over the last two years uh, has weakened his government through uh, poor governance, number one, and number two, the fact that uh, he has been weakened by infighting within his party. Mm. So when people from the outside look at um, Nepali politics and they find that the prime minister is weakened, uh, they think it is a weakening to the parliamentary process. But actually it is the power struggles within his party, uh, the other side essentially led by the former Maoist chieftain Pushpa Kamal Dahal, so there is that dynamic that also has helped in the weakening of Prime Minister Oli. Now, in that situation, the question we need to look at is, was Mr. Oli uh, very willingly moving towards uh, uh, this new map or not? This is something that he will write in his memoirs, I guess, when he gets around to it. However, let me try and suggest to you what I know is that this map, after the November uh, oh, haha, with the uh, inauguration of the road. Firstly, I would say that definitely the Indian government, whoever manages foreign policy and whoever looks at Nepal, they definitely mismanaged affairs, not looking at what, how this would trigger the reaction in Nepal. So to that extent, right. I consider, I still believe that the trigger was the inauguration of that road. Now, right. um, when uh, that happened, by January, the, the related uh, Nepali uh, Ministry of Land Affairs, Land Reform Affairs, they had prepared this new map in January. Poli sat on this map from January till May, hoping that Mr. Modi and his people would come across for uh, discussions uh, digitally uh, through, uh, through Zoom, or whatever, uh, but it did not happen. In the meantime, all party parliamentary committees were pushing at him to come out with this map. Then finally, what is known as the Secretariat of the Ruling Party, which has all the heavy honchos, the big honchos there, they also cornered Mr. Oli. So I would say that Mr. Oli then decided to jump in and go all out. But we must look at the nuance of it all, that one, the trigger, the India's trigger to ne Nepali domestic politics to get sparked. And then Mr. Oli's uh, uh, initial reluctance and then his willingness to go all out. I believe in a discussion such as this, we must have some of this nuance sure, as well. Sure. On the plate. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, you, do you also want to come in on the, maybe I can ask Raghav Ji first and then come back to you. Uh, Ambassador Sood, um, what, what is your take on the, um, the the report prepared by the Eminence Persons Group? Uh, report submitted in 2018. Why there is no movement on that? Uh, you know, I, I have a feeling that uh, having been part of the government once again, these Eminent Persons Group reports, uh, you know, there must be at least a hundred of them in MEA. <laughs> we set up, you know, there was a point in time when we were uh, happily setting up eminent persons group uh, with everybody, with, with EU. That's an anniversary tactic you were saying. No, no, no. With EU, with France, with Germany, with England, with America, etc., etc. I mean, we set it up with a number of countries. And they produce reports. And as an as an ambassador in France, I have hosted the eminent persons uh, myself a number of times and participated in these meetings. Uh, you know, these are uh, well-meaning people, and it's uh, it's a way of enhancing people-to-people -people contacts. But uh, the reports are not binding. I mean, if I, I, there is there is this idea that it has not been accepted is not something, I mean, it is lying in the ministry. It, there is no formal ceremony that it takes place. So, Ambassador, so, is is, here, is, here is the problem. So, there is no formal diplomacy happening. Uh, there is no, not enough conversation happening between the two sides. And here right, is the report you. that has not been taken seriously. So, what are we doing with Nepal? 
well uh, to, to that i think you are right i think uh, we have been uh, not adequately in touch with nepal or things like that and uh, and i think that we the relationship that's why i said that the relationship seems to be deteriorating and we are uh, standing at a fairly uh, bleak juncture and you know but this is happy mon i'll just uh, one sentence i'll add but this is where it becomes very important for political leaders to understand that brinkmanship there has to be right. a limit because beyond a point what happens is that something untoward happens like two three days ago we saw an incident of firing where an indian citizen was killed at the border right, at right, sitamarhi right, right, and two right. others injured now India. this was something that is not linked it is not at all linked to kalapani it is thousands of kilometers away from kalapani i mean this right. is on the bihar border of sitamarhi but Ambassador. on that day i was asked by a number of television channels as to why these were linked and was there a linkage now you know but this is how things happen when you are engaging in brinkmanship and things get out of control so at these points i think wisdom on the part of political leadership is to press the pause button but uh, we seem to be doing a fast forward we've just adopted a constitutional amendment if i see the newspapers today uh, in nepal it has already been submitted to the upper house i assume that it will clear the upper house and then it will become part of the constitution so Be- before i go to right hope for dialogue right uh, b- before i go to uh, mr dikshit i have i have to ask ask this question uh, my 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 viewers would be very unhappy if i didn't address the uh, the elephant in the room china uh, how serious do you think because there's a lot of argument uh, made in india about the chinese increasing chinese influence in uh, uh, in nepal um, how much credibility should we give to that sort of a narrative that sort of an argument that china is now becoming a major player in nepalis political that's going to be against our interests well happy one i think uh, china is becoming a major player full stop i think that is the first sentence secondly if it is becoming a major player uh, it's expanding its influence it's expanding it in its influence with the belt and road initiative for example as far away as europe right and as far away as africa so it is only natural that it would expand its influence in its vicinity which means south asia and so uh, i mean i i think it is part of uh, the fact that uh, you have a more prosperous a uh, more economically stronger china a politically more assertive china a china that feels that it's time to assume responsibilities has come and uh, we saw that in fact uh, we saw a lot of uh, nepali newspapers talking about the fact that the chinese ambassador was trying to play uh, an important political mediatory role between the prime minister and other senior leaders of his party to bring about a rapprochement so that right. uh, the government uh, could should not be destabilized so right uh so the fact that china has expanded its influence is certainly what has changed is that in the past china used to get its concerns addressed because it had direct dealings with the palace now with the abolition mm-hmm. of monarchy with nepal becoming a republic the chinese have reached out and have established closer ties with political parties across the board and uh, earlier but they didn't bother too much about the political parties they focused much more on um, getting their concerns addressed and their concerns largely at that point in time related to the tibetan community uh, which would come in from uh, tibet into nepal as refugees and then some of them would also uh, go to other countries including come to dharamshala and so on in india but uh, as china has grown economically chinese trade has grown china is doing development projects um, it is nepal is part of the belt and road initiative china has talked of building a railway line all the way up to into nepal into up to kathmandu and maybe beyond 
So these are uh, big infrastructure related right. projects. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Dixon, two questions. One is the whole China question, if you if you could address that. And also, I think you should tell us what is the uh, uh, way forward from here on for India-Nepal relations. First, uh, allow me to go head to head with Ambassador Sood on the eminent sure. person group report. Sure, uh, sure. I mean, yeah. One, one aspect forward, yeah. where I I would have to defend the, pro, the what the Indian Foreign Ministry does with the EPGs. Uh, talking to the former ambassador, but I would say don't look at all the EPGs that your government may have set up and all the all the tomes that they are and yeah. the gathering dust. Whereas the Nepal India EPG, firstly, it was uh, there were five eminent uh, eminent persons from each country um, designated by the sitting prime ministers on both sides during their first terms. And given that the only defining treaty beyond the border treaty, other issues are defined by the 1950 treaty between peace and friendship between Nepal and India, there was a need to upgrade these. So, and it was certainly, in, uh, there is no binding factor in this, in the report. The report has been prepared, I gather, by consensus. And it is indeed gathering dust. What I understand is, if, if it were, completely uh, a, a, a non-formal exercise that no government needs to take command uh, of or to, to obey the commands of, then why not release it? There's a reluctance and this reluctance is in the PMO in New Delhi. So I would say that one way to move ahead uh, is actually to uh, open up that book and see what's in there and uh, have the confidence to see what's in there because both you prime ministers actually assigned that uh, that uh, entity uh, sure. from the point of uh, china there is no doubt that china is getting more involved in nepal for some of the reasons that ambassador sood uh, talked about uh, added to that the blockade that uh, was conducted on nepal which made nepal look to the north for uh, outlets and possible third country transit, but more importantly, uh, routes into the Chinese production centers. Uh, but in an ironical way, there is historical justice in this because Kathmandu Valley was economically extremely connected to Tibet in particular, uh, not so much uh, the mainland China. So in a way, Nepal is, if you look at it in one way, Nepal is coming into its own having linkages to the north and south. On the other hand, do we have to uh, worry about uh, in, uh, Chinese adventurism in Nepal, just as we have suffered Indian adventurism in the past? Definitely. And uh, I would say that uh, one should leave it to the Kathmandu polity to learn from its mistakes and not let uh, Beijing run roughshod uh, over it, because it is a factor that India has been so overwhelmingly important for Nepal that sometimes Nepal has overcorrected in being extremely obsequious towards Beijing. Uh, I think we should, right. we, in the new world, we should not go in that direction. But let me give you an interesting factor. Before COVID-19 um, pandemic came and all the flights came, uh, airline uh, air routes were brought down, mm -hmm. China was by now much better connected to Kathmandu multiple cities, multiple flights a day than India. So this is uh, not necessarily the path to the future. Nepal should have evolving cultural economic links to India uh, as much as uh, it is developing towards the north. Uh, looking ahead, you suggested that I also suggest uh, some... Right, path right. We are in a state today, a stage today where Nepal for whatever reason is uh, has never been politically as united to the political party lines uh, since the adoption of the constitution when day before yesterday the uh, there was a adoption of the new map by the house of representatives uh, you can say that that was because of ultra nationalism that nobody could back away from but the reality is that not just the non-governmental polity of Nepal, 
but across the board, the political parties were made, uh, did join in on a unanimous or a consensus document, including from those, uh, uh, from the Madis uh, plains, people from the uh, various other folds, including the royalist parties. Uh, and the day after, there was even a tweet from the former king uh, welcoming this step. So in a way, Nepal is politically for now, uh, for whatever it's worth, united uh, on this matter, which means that this becomes both an opportunity and a challenge for the other side. How can we move ahead? I would suggest three, two specific actions. One is an absolute status quo on the Limpia Dura area, which means a halt to the building of the road by the Indian Army, the Border Roads Organization, because that is the provocation that has led us into this. If India believes that it has, in a way, quote-unquote, lost Nepal, the provocation came from the inauguration of that particular road at that particular time. So, uh, I believe one should be status quo in that area while we let the temper school. Uh, so, there should be a compartmentalization in the meantime. Uh, just as uh, India and China have border disputes, but they also continue to have linkages, it's inconceivable that Nepal and India cannot and should not continue with everything else going on while we say that we will just isolate this problem for now while we hold discussions. I think it's very important for the two prime ministers uh, to get on the phone uh, and to talk to each other and say, let us for now not agree to disagree on Limpia Dura, but let us just keep it on hold while we continue with other activities and other issues to be discussed between the two countries. In the meantime, I believe sooner than later, there has to be discussions where, we have talked about this in the earlier part of this program, all the paperwork that exists, all the talks and the discussions and even the notepads, uh, the maps, the archives, whatever is in there, all of them be brought together and experts to sit down while overseen by the politicians, the prime ministers right. of the country, because we knew we do need to get through this because the cultural, economic, social, and geopolitical linkages with India and between India and Nepal are too important. And the, the uh, uniqueness of this relationship actually is, should be exemplary for the other countries of South Asia. Instead, we, are, uh, we have ended up in this mess. So we must get out of it. But Abbas Asood, any final thoughts uh, from you on the next steps uh, for India-Nepal relations? You know, in diplomacy, um, way back in the 50s, uh, you know, we used to have the favorite sort of uh, phrase for comprehensive treaties used to be peace and friendship. I mean, the right. India signed in the 1950s a number of such friendship treaties and so on. Uh, more recently, as you know, it has become strategic partnerships. So now we right. have signed many strategic partnerships. So there are certain things that become uh, more current, as it were. And similarly, All right. uh, during the 2000s, particularly, uh, the idea of uh, eminent persons group to kind of give an impulse to bilateral relations was something that was, we did one with ASEAN, we did one with uh, Singapore, we did, as I said, we must have done it with at least two dozen countries. So you were just fooling everybody, the whole world. No, you just didn't need no. it. No, no, it's not that. It's not that. I mean, the governments take a look at some of the recommendations. Some of the recommendations get adopted. They get converted into policy. Let me, let me get by, back to By the Commerce Ministry or the Foreign Ministry or something like that. As Here was the idea. Be. Here was the idea, Rakesh. Uh, I guess we are, now, we are now down to Kanak and Rakesh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the idea was until the last moment it almost worked the idea was that the and these are the eminent the eminences themselves that were saying this not any of us there was an agreement that they would hand it over to mr modi he would and that would be like a formal uh, uh inauguration if you will uh, of the document and then it would be released in Kathmandu after having been presented to mr oli i do believe that there you haven't seen it, I haven't seen it, but I do believe that there are certain formulae and neither do I believe that there is any 
God given rule of how uh, EPGs work, and this is the format, and now their time is past. No, I believe that their time is now for this present particular EPG, whatever you may say. I agree that you know if there was if the uh, if there was yet another meeting of the EPG and the Prime Minister received them and then there is a photo opportunity they present the report but even if the report had been presented and you had seen a picture of the Prime Minister of India receiving that report that still does not mean that the report would have been made public that's not members, normal the members the members i understand had I, I do not just, know just that just 30 seconds uh, uh, if you wish to add anything yeah like I, start, uh, I mean in terms of the only thing i would say is that uh, i think that uh, you know from what i hear is that uh, even in recent weeks there were uh, messages that were sent out mm -hmm. to the nepali political leadership to kind of press the pause button so that we could give dialogue a chance. But that doesn't seem to be happening. So therefore, I am frankly quite pessimistic now about how soon dialogue will be resumed. My guess is uh, not very soon because I think we will wait and see what happens. If the constitutional amendment goes through, well, let's say it creates a new political reality. And uh, Thank you. we want to then have a disputed territory, disputed boundary with Nepal. I mean, you know, uh, it's not a happy situation with regard to uh, a country with whom we have had open borders. And uh, this is where the unexpected often happens and ends up creating an in inadvertent escalation in the relationship. So, uh, I mean, I would still say that the best way to bring about dialogue, and the only way you can resolve these things is through dialogue, the best way to bring about dialogue is actually to press pause. Right, just 30 seconds, Kanak Sab, if, if you have to add anything. Nepal and India are now at par, so it's time for dialogue. Why are they at par? Because India does not require constitutional amendment to change its maps, as it did in November, for example, November 2. Uh, it's 6th, 7th, and 7th uh, and 8th edition of the by the Survey of India. Nepal ha happens to have its uh, state seal in the constitution and the state seal uh, has the map within it so it had to do it otherwise in discussions with nepal there will be a question that even your map in your seal is not the new map so right. how can you uh, right. where, where are you on this so i believe that right. things are now at par and discussions sooner or later should must happen for all the reasons i mentioned Right. Gentlemen, this has been a fantastic conversation. So much wisdom and experience between the two of us. It couldn't have gotten any better. Thank you so much for coming on the show. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.